Hello everyone. Now I'll be discussing question of neurology. Well, we have a 34-year-old man. He is being treated in intensive care unit for being involved in motorcycle accident. Well, his CT scan revealed area of contusion and swelling without any bleeding. And uh, on second day, he has been put on ventriclostomy to measure the intracranial pressure. On third day, the pressure is still very high despite sedation, elevation of head, end of the bed, removal of CSF. We know very well there are the three procedures that have been done to control his raised ICP. But they did not work. Now the question is, they plan to do hyperventilation for this patient. Why, the, now the question is, how? what the basic concept by which hyperventilation is going to reduce intracranial pressure in this? That's the main question. The answer to this question is A, that is cerebral vasoconstriction is the mechanism. Well, why is the answer? For that, we got to learn some basic concept. Brain is an encased organ. It is totally close and caused by the bones, that is skull. And there is no place for expansion, no total in, encased. Well, if you look into this, the if we draw a simple diagram, this is the brain and okay, this is spinal cord and this is the where CSF flows, a very rough. This is the brain parenchyma and in the brain parenchyma we can draw a blood vessel also. This is the blood vessel which is supplying blood, okay. And of course, this vein artery going and vein coming, brain parenchyma, most simplified. So this skull having CSF, brain parenchyma and the blood, which is going via artery coming by vein, total encased. So these are the three things which are going to determine the pressure. Well, even slightest change in pressure in any one of three components, that is cerebral blood flow and CSF and the brain parenchyma. The CSF flow will happen whenever there is obstruction to CSF flow. And brain parenchyma, when any of the space occupying lesion, SOL, space occupying lesion, which could be a tumor, it could be abscess, granuloma, anything which can cause increase, uh, increase in the volume of parenchyma. And the third parameter is cerebral blood flow. So the, this pressure, intracranial pressure, can be modified by three important, three di distinct compartments ca can determine overall intracranial pressure, what we write as ICP, brain parenchyma, the CSF, and cerebral blood flow. As I told you in the simple uh, line diagram, three parameters which are going to affect ICP. So we take by, one by one. Brain parenchyma and CSF, they were relatively constant pressure except in circumstances uh, like I told you space occupying lesion or any obstruction to CSF flow which is going to cause hydrocephalus. Okay. Well, third parameter is cerebral blood flow where the blood is going by artery and coming back by the veins. This is influenced by systemic BP. Very, very important point to got to know. So definitely uh, when the BP will rise, the intracranial pressure will also uh, tend to rise, but it still has been kept under great control by cerebrovascular autoregulation. It means the patient may be having high systemic BP, but still autoregulation can, to a great extent, they can control the CSF blood, uh, uh, blood flow, cerebral blood flow they can control. But in addition to this, Partial pressure of oxygen, PaO2, 
and PaCO2. They also have an effect, important role in regulating cerebral blood flow, especially in conditions like stroke and uh, trauma, PaO2 and PaCO2 also. And whenever this is disrupted, then that can again lead to increase ICP. Okay, well, cerebral blood flow is a very important target in therapy. So that's why whenever we are treating a case or raise ICP, we always tar uh, target about cerebral blood flow. CO2 is a constant regulator of cerebral blood flow. Very, very important. It's far greater than PaO2. Okay, although in the previous slide, I did mention that this control, this control, but it is PaCO2 has far more effect on controlling raised ICP as compared to O2. So level of cerebral PA would rises, so does the blood flow will rise, right? So we, if we can reduce the PaCO2 by hyperventilation, this will result in vasoconstriction and that will lead to reduce ICP, okay? Well, now I have a question for you. Stop the video, write down the answer. There's one patient on ICU and we are doing hyperventilation, of course, to wash out CO2. But my question is, you can stop the video, write down the answer in your copy when we are doing hyperventilation. What change will occur in ABG of this patient? Very simple question is there. The change will happen is, as we are doing hyperventilation, patient will go into respiratory alkalosis. Why respiratory alkalosis? Because CO2 is getting washed out. CO2 is an acid and that goes out and that will produce alkalosis in the body. Well, we talked about hyperventilation as a way, mechanism to reduce ICP. Let us learn other mechanism, other intervention that can lower ICP uh, raise intraocular pressure. Reducing systemic BP, the point I mentioned, which is directly going to reduce uh, cerebral blood flow. Reducing metabolic demand, this, that's why we give mild sedation to the patient. Increasing venous outflow, head end is elevated, it was done, already done in our patient also. Reducing brain parenchyma water content, that we can give by some like mannitol, which is a osmotic diuretic. And in fact, one of, it is one of the most commonly initial method uh, used in intensive care to reduce ICP. But again, I have a question for you. Stop the video, write down the answer. You plan to give mannitol in a patient who is admitted to you in neurosurgical ICU. But before giving mannitol, what is the single most important precaution you will take that, uh, that guide you whether to give mannitol or not? Write down the answer in your copy. Well, the most important is patient should not be in congestive heart failure. If congestive heart failure is there, then giving mentol is absolutely contraindicated because if the patient in CHF or in renal failure, renal failure, in this condition, if you give, patient may land up in pulmonary edema. So do not give in this situation. So this clearance, the cardiac clearance and as patient should be passing urine also is mandatory. One more method is to reduce CSF by repeated therapeutic lumbar puncture. Or rather they can put a tube between the ventricle and the abdominal cavity, peritoneal cavity. So that, uh, that will drain the CSF from the ventricle into the abdomen. Now let's look into other option. Decrease capillary leak, cerebral blood flow is tightly regulated. So that 
that is mediated by cerebral vasodilatation rather than the capillary leak. Capillary leak has no role in reducing ICP. Decreased sympathetic outflow, hyperventilation does not significantly affect sympathetic outflow of the brain. It mediated predominantly by pressure of the compartment, brain, CSF, and blood at the point, three point I already mentioned to you. Sympathetic has no role to play in the brain. Submit increased PaO2. In the initially also, I told you the three, two things are there, PaO2, PaCO2, and PaCO2 has much more effect as compared to O2. And moreover, ka, ka, even if you increase O2, it's not going to have as good effect as of reducing PaCO2. Of course, we can, we can change by changing concentration of inhaled oxygen. That means we can increase FiO2. Okay, and expiratory pressure we can do by ventilatory pressure. In fact, this these two things we use in the treatment of ARDS. Okay. Well, I did mention to regarding FiO2. Now again, stop the video, write down the answer. What do you mean by FiO2? Or I can say what is the normal FiO2? Stop the video, write down the answer. Well, the normal FiO2 is 0.21. Why is that answer? Well, you and me are breathing from the atmosphere. We know that atmosphere has 21% of the oxygen. Okay. So out of 100, it is 21. Out of 100, 21%. So in the range, out of 1, it will be to 0.2% if you calculate from 1 as a standard. So this is 2-1. So that's why normal FiO2 is 0.21 or you can say 21% if you calculate by 100. Okay. So we can increase FiO2 by increasing concentration, but it's definitely, I told you, partial pressure oxygen has less role to play as compared to PaCO2 in regulating ICP. Well, increase venous drainage. That we do by raising the head end, which Remember, in our patient, it was already being done, sedation was done, and even head end was raised. That will, by the effect of gravity, blood will come out of the brain. But again, CO2 reduction is far important in hyperventilation. The golden line to remember, short-term hyperventilation help to lower ICP by causing a washout of CO2, and that due to vasoconstriction, and that decreases cerebral blood flow, and that reduces intracranial pressure. A summary intervention for lowering ICP. Head elevation, increase venous outflow from the brain. Sedation, decrease metabolic demand and to control hypertension. Intravenous mentol, it, it, it acts like an osmotic diuresis, hyperventilation, CO2 washout, and that leads to cerebral vasoconstriction, removal of CSF, reduction of CSF, and this is done by repeated therapeutic lumbar puncture. Thank you very much.